Hi there, I'm Georgie Ainsley, and every week I talk to someone who is a performance person. They could be an athlete from the world of entertainment, business, or politics. They could even be an astronaut. The key link is, of course, that they all know how to perform at the top level, and they can teach us all a thing or two about how to do that in our own lives at whatever it is that we do. Performance People is available wherever you get your podcasts, or of course, you can watch us on YouTube, where you can also subscribe, and please do. Paula Radcliffe, MBE, is a former British long-distance runner. She's a three-time London Marathon winner and New York Marathon champion, Chicago and Helsinki Marathon winner, and has won multiple medals at World Championships and Commonwealth Games. She lives in Monaco with her family and is now an athletics commentator. We actually do just have to do this. You don't have a choice. We have to go through this. We're going to kill this tumour. We're going to visualise each day the tumour shrinking, like you visualise in training that you're getting to a better platform. He was the first person to give me a big hug when I was brought back after Athens, um, and that was all I needed at that point. didn't need any words. There were no words. I just needed a hug. It was actually challenging my integrity and everything that I stood up for, and people not believing the truth about you, uh, which was really, really hard to deal with. And he was the person saying, you know what, you know the truth. You can only control what you control. Um, You can't control what other people do. You can't control what life throws at you. You can't control what someone else is going to do in the race and how they're going to turn up. You can only control yourself. Female sport's there for a reason. It needs to be protected. It's not personal. It's not discriminatory. It is just making sure that that female category is what it's meant to be, a female category. And it's fair competition. So, Paula, thanks so much for agreeing to do this pod. Just before we came um, on air, we had some technical issues, which we've now (laughs) resolved. But in our technical issues chat, I asked you what you had for breakfast this morning, as is sort of standard procedure for a sound person, which I'm not, to ask of their guest, which you are. And and what was your response? (laughs) So my response was that in the morning, I generally get up. First thing, I have some freshly squeezed lemon juice. And then I have a cup of, of black coffee and a couple of squares of dark chocolate. And then I get my run in and then I usually have quite a good breakfast. But because I was rushing and a bit late this morning, I literally just had a quick protein shake and a banana. So is it standard because everything else sounds pretty normal, but is it standard for you to have a couple of squares of chocolate every morning? Is that sort of a a performance thing from your past? I don't know if it's a performance thing or a personal thing. Um, I just, I do really like dark chocolate. I justify (laughs) it with that. It's got um, resveratrol. It's got magnesium in. It's, um, it's a quick energy fix. And I guess that's the reason why I started doing it is if I'm rushing out, I know I can't always really do that on an empty stomach. Um, I used to when I was training in preparation for marathons sometimes. Um, but now it's just something that's quickly digested. So it's not going to repeat or bounce around on me in my, in my stomach, but it's going to give me a quick bit of an energy shot. So for every my run. single so then person. I get my run in and then I have the healthy breakfast. See, every single person listening to this pod is going to think, amazing. Paula Radcliffe has given me permission to eat chocolate for breakfast. It's just, it has to be dark chocolate, right? It has to be dark chocolate. <laughs> It's more pre-breakfast. I think of it Even like it's better. my pre-breakfast. Even better. Um, so I was, I was Googling you. I was Googling you, as everybody would do, um, in preparation for a chat. And the first thing that popped up that I, I couldn't seem to lose from the first page of Google searches was that Paula Radcliffe Way is being resurfaced. <laughs> It's everywhere in oh the Bedford God. News that they're resurfacing Paula Radcliffe Way. It's not even been there that long. <laughs> I just, How I just the loved it. Resurfacing? There are about 25 articles about how they've had delays and setbacks and problems with the resurfacing oh works, but gosh. now they're well and truly on top of it and works will be completed as expected. So I'm sure you're very relieved to hear that. <laughs> yeah, and thank goodness my parents have moved away from there. <laughs> Um, so the other thing then that came up was this, and and actually I had to track back quite a long way to find it because you're obviously a very private person. Um, but then this, then these articles started to appear about the things that you had dealt with in the pandemic and post pandemic with your beautiful daughter being sick and her cancer diagnosis and also losing your dad. And I was thinking to myself, well, so many of us had our own stories through the pandemic to deal with, but that sounds like a pretty excruciating thing to have gone through during that period of time. I mean, did you channel, did you use, I mean, sometimes sport can help you in lots of different ways. Did you have to use what you know, your inner resources to actually get yourself through that period? 
Without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, I mean, running's always been kind of my healing time, what I've turned to, to, to make me feel better, to kind of make me feel better to attack the day, to think through things. If I've got big decisions to make or problems to solve, I always have found that that would work better on a run right back to when I was doing my A-levels and I couldn't do a maths problem. I'd just go out for a run. When I came back, I could look at it with fresh eyes and, and kind of get it done. Um, but through that time, I mean, through the time that my dad was in the um, intensive care unit, uh, I couldn't, we could only just speak to him. Luckily, we had a really nice nurse who would kind of just put the, the phone on speaker beside mm -hmm. him because he was in, on a ventilator. Um, and, and that was so, so hard. So I would kind of rehearse through what I was going to say, because obviously every conversation that I've always had with my dad has always been, there's somebody else answering you and you know that he's hearing what I'm saying and he's the, he was the best listener ever. Um, so it was really, really hard to get in my head, what am I going to say? And I'm really proud of my daughter that at that time when she was just turned 13, um, that she was able to to kind of sit and talk to him because we didn't know, and as it turned out, when they took him off the ventilator, he didn't come through it. Um, so I don't, we don't know whether he could hear us or not. He did open his eyes. The nurse was able to tell us that. But I think because of the COVID thing, it was that made it all so, so much harder, not least the fact that they, to the end, insisted on the diagnosis being a potential COVID, and it was not at all. Um, it was heart failure that was confused as COVID. Um, so he was in kind of this middle room literally because they couldn't put him into the intensive care unit with the non-COVID patients and they couldn't put him with the COVID patients because he kept testing negative. They kept insisting it was that, it wasn't that. So he was literally in, in the corridor in between the two. Um, and we couldn't get to see him. My mum couldn't get in to see him. So trying to, to be there for everyone was, was really, really impossible. And the flip side of being somebody who kind of is a little bit in the public eye, is I was actually told as well, no, you can't break the rules. You can't try and go into the UK mm. to see him um, because then it'll be, oh, well, she did. And so you, you can't. Um, and yet I had friends who were doing that, who were just going back to, to see parents that were not well um, and for funerals and things like that. Uh, and I couldn't do that. So, yeah, it was extremely hard. And then, so that was uh, 8th of April. My dad um, passed away. So it was kind of really at the beginning of lockdown. Um, and so then we had to kind of survive through that. In the end, I snapped and I got permission from the Monaco government so the date that everything opened up in kind of France, Monaco, um, May the 11th, I was able to fly back to uh, Heath, flew back to Heathrow. My mum met me in the car park there. We still didn't know all that was going around about COVID um, and everything. So I literally had two pairs of two sets of clothing um, and I stripped off in the car park, the outer layer, put it in a bin bag, put it in the back of her car. Then I was able to give her a hug, go back to her house, washed all my kit out. And then the next day, um, just put her in the car. She slept the entire way back here. And we had permission to kind of drive through all of the um, all of the controls along the way um, and she stayed with us then for about five, six weeks um, before came back to the UK with her the first time. And then we did that a couple of times because she was so scared to fly. Um, and then the second time that we took her back was kind of August time. And my daughter had been kind of acting up a little bit. I think she was kind of like, I don't know, she was spending a bit more time in the gym. She was definitely more temperamental, um, crying a lot more. She was getting extremely painful periods. Um, and so when we came back from dropping mum that time, went straight in to see the paediatrician. Um, paediatrician sent us for a scan the next day. And within a week, we were starting chemo oh in um, the hospital in Nice. Um, and I think, yeah, that through that time, I mean, A, Looking back on it, so, so fortunate that we have an amazing paediatrician who actually lost a mum and a sister to ovarian cancer. So the minute she felt the lump and the mass in Isla's stomach, I knew on her face that, that something was wrong. Um, and then very, very quick to reassure us that like the adolescent version is not ovarian cancer. It is a malignant germ tumour and it's... It's bad, but it's it's no it's treatable, uh, and the prognosis was good. We'd caught it, um, kind of I guess 
fairly late in there. It was quite big. It was 16 centimetres by 13 centimetres by 11 centimetres. So it's huge. Um, and that was why she'd kind of been spending more time in the gym. She thought that she was putting on weight. And so she was doing more sit-ups and things like that. And obviously that was why the painful periods, um, because sometimes it was the tumour bleeding, not not an actual period. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of things then made sense and talking to her about it at that point it was actually a relief because I think she was she struggling with something wasn't right and psychologically all of that was coming out and I mean she gets mad with me now but I was very open with it. I said I'd, I'd actually researched child psychologists and I thought it was some kind of kick-on effect from losing my dad um, and I'd researched all of that and then we found out what it was she had an explanation it became extremely tough and it was scary but I think for her it was a relief to know that she wasn't imagining things, she wasn't acting out. It was there was a real reason why she didn't feel like herself uh, and why she was kind of feeling all of these emotions swirling around inside. And her haemoglobin was kind of nine because um, the tumour was taking everything. So um, the effect on her body and why she was feeling so fatigued was huge. Um, and so, yeah, we went through the, the chemo. The first stage, so we had three stays of um you stay in for a week but it's kind of five consecutive days uh, of treatment and then they keep you in for another 24 hours just to make sure that they kind of flush out all of the the chemo nastiness um from your body before she left so she was on drips and things the entire time that she was in the stay and then we'd have a couple of weeks off um, which would be longer towards the end because it, she needed the white cells to come back up again before she went back in for the next the next day. Um, and so she would absolutely be very open and say that the worst thing for her was losing her hair. Yeah. That was the hardest thing for her. She said she could deal with all the tiredness. Um, we kind of, she had, she had the support with the rest of it. I don't think she was ever so low that she thought she wasn't going to get through it. Um, and I think that was also a real blessing um, and also maybe a little bit of, of childhood naivety and everything. But she said that the first day was fine because she didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. The second day she knew what was going to happen, but it was worse. So there was me with my sports person mentality going and come on, we've got this. This is the last day. This yeah. is like the home straight now. We've absolutely got this. And she said, you know what, mum, that was the last thing I wanted to hear because <laughs> the third one was the worst one. And she actually for her brevet exam which was um, equivalent of GCSEs she wrote about it uh, and she wrote about how that third state was the very worst because wow. she had expected the second one to be like the first one and it was worse so she was fully expecting this one to be a lot worse again um, and actually she said it wasn't as bad as she had built it up to be but going into it was absolutely the worst time whereas for me I think I found the the actual surgery stay harder um, because, you just feel yeah, complete just really a complete lack of control as well because you're obviously somebody yeah, that yeah. plans meticulously about everything but suddenly like this is completely out of your comfort zone this is completely out of your control we're living in a shut down world where immunity is king and you know the prize goal basically is to stay <laughs> well and you're dealing with all of this with with the, the the you know the person that you love the most in the world so what you know did you have how did you sort of make sure that you you didn't or, or did you just show her exactly how you felt as you went through through that journey or were you able to compartmentalize it did you get to a place where you ever could yeah and that's where I think I think the running and the sports mentality helped me in a lot of ways um it helped me because I could just get that time so for me if I was going out um from the hospital and we were under the 1k restriction so I was literally running up and down a 1k restriction the first day and then the next time I could go up to 5k radio so that was fine um but I, if I could even just do 20 minutes of that and just go in and then have kind of got all of those demons, all of that anguish out of my system and process that a little bit more, then I could go back and I could be a strong person for her because she will openly admit that 
what you want there and you're probably the person that you need there the most when you're going through something like that is your mom is someone that mm. you can be horrible to you can be bitchy to you can say keep those yeah. nurses the hell out of my room i don't want this. you can do all the rude stuff and i said you can do all of that to me you can do it to the nurses yeah. they're amazing and they were absolutely amazing and she wasn't um i said but if you don't want to speak you can absolutely and she had this pink hoodie and she was like snuggled up in the bed with a hoodie like pulled over her head and she's like sometimes i don't want to talk but if i do want to talk i need you to be there and I think she just needed to know that no matter what, I was there and I was strong. And whatever she told me that she could eat that day, we'd go and get it. And so it was completely random. Sometimes it was really easy. I just want a pan au chocolat. I can go and get that from the cafeteria downstairs. No problem. Kiwis was a little bit harder. I had to run to the shop to be able to find those and then run back like holding kiwis in my hand. But it was just, OK, anything that you can eat, tell me what it is. And we will try and make that happen. Um, and then the sports mentality as well of just literally control what you can control, do what you can each day. That way really helped. So we had a plan. We had the chemo plan. The nurses and the doctors were amazing in explaining it all. And so being able to have that as well and say, okay, we actually do just have to do this. You don't have a choice. We have to go through this. We're going to kill this tumor. We're going to visualize each day the tumor shrinking like you visualize in training that you're getting to a better platform. We're going to visualize, visualize that tumor shrinking. And then the fact that they do scans at the end of each day and every couple of weeks as well, and they were showing us, okay, this much has died. You might be feeling like shit, but the tumor is dying now. And by the time she went in for surgery at the end, it was 95% dead. There was only a tiny little kernel in the middle of it um, that was still alive and that needed to be removed. So that really helped. And then I think the teamwork just, I'm very, very fortunate in that I had some amazing friends and family around us. Um, and not just in terms of supporting Isla and myself, but making sure that Gary and Raf were okay as well, because the trauma that goes through your mind thinking, okay, I'm concentrating on one child. And he's actually now got to go through school. He's not getting that support that I was able to give before with kind of the French homework and with everything there. So having a very good friend of his and uh, his mum is a, is a great friend of mine, just having her there to be able to say, you know what, I've got Raph. I can look after him. He's being, he's fine. Liaising with the teachers there to make sure that's okay. And then having my support, support work of friends around me that I could literally just call and chat to and go into the parents room and cry and chat to them not in front of her um really really helped me um and one friend just called one day and she knew that I was worrying because chemo just kills your appetite and she didn't want to eat anything and she said ask Isla if she'll eat my homemade pizza and I said you know what I could do so she drove from Monaco to Nice in the pandemic with this pizza wrapped in foil. She wasn't able to stay. She literally just had to hand it over in the car park. And then the best thing to be able to say, phone her back and say, you know what, she ate everything. And you're, you're in those moments and you're having to crisis manage, right? So you're just in complete and utter, we're going to get through this. We're going to crisis manage it mode. And then, and then thank God the best thing happens and it goes away and, and you you've got the all clear. Do you have any form of PTSD after that? Do you have any form of how, how to deal with that afterwards? Because it feels to me like you throw all your resources at the problem and then what happens after? And I know as athletes, you talk a lot about not having great highs and great lows and always keeping this sort of middle ground, this equilibrium uh, with everything you do, whether that be training or competition. I mean, how do you manage that in real life with a, with a dilemma like, like the one that you've been through? I think the biggest thing is being honest um, and talking about it. And that's one thing that I'm eternally grateful that my my parents and especially my dad taught me. And um, mm. I did feel like going through this when I needed that advice from my dad. If I thought about it, I knew it because he'd done such a great job teaching me that growing up and being there and kind of just all of those little things they'd said to me through the years. So, um, I mean, obviously he... He was the first person to give me a big hug when I was brought back after Athens. Um, and that was all I needed at that point. I didn't need any words. There were no words. I just needed a hug. And he was there with that. He was the person of reason when I went through everything um, in 2015, which up until that point had probably been the worst thing that I'd gone through because it was actually challenging my integrity and everything that I stood up for and people not believing the truth about you, uh, which was really, really hard to deal with. And he was the person saying, you know what, you know the truth. The people that are important to you know the truth. And he was able to, to say all of that. So I think going through that put me in a really good place 
to kind of deal with this. And I think the first thing I had to say was, yeah, you know what? There, there is trauma, sorry. There is trauma that comes from this um, and that will always be there and we have to talk about it. And I, I've talked about it with Isla. She was brilliant in coming to me, actually not after the first day. We had um, a little bit of a scare. So she had tests every couple of months and then we were just about to go from every two month checks to um, four to six month checks when there was something showed up on one of the MRIs. So in February, she was rushed in again and they did a whole um, other operation. So they were an hour and a half by keyhole, couldn't find anything, actually did a whole cesarean thing, still couldn't find anything. So then she came out the other side and they said, it's great, there's nothing bad in there. And I said, yeah, but we just canceled a holiday. She's just gone through all of that anguish uh, mm. of the cancer being back. So how do I explain to a 16 year old that, yeah, it's all hunky dory. It's great. There's nothing there. It's fine. It, there are, there is still that trauma there. And she at that point turned around to me and she said, mom, you need to find me a psychologist. Um, wow. so I put her in touch with somebody. They do a Skype, um, calls as, as, as often as she needs. And it has been amazing. Um, and we've talked with her about the fact that now I think actually she was always, one of those kids that has a slightly higher level of emotional maturity, even from yeah. a little kid. Um, and she has a sense of, of empathy and a sense of standing up and saying what she thinks, even when it gets her in hot water. Um, she's always had that. Um, and that has, if anything, become a little bit greater. So we've talked about the fact that she can expect from her friends the same level of emotional understanding and kind of really getting it and being there um and she has to be able to to be okay with that and to kind of like forgive them for that it's that she's gone through something that's made her um a tougher stronger person with then that she's going to make sure that those higher standards can fix for herself but she can't put those on other people yeah it's really interesting that isn't it it's sort of like you say she's been through something that no one you know the whole bunch of people especially her school friends can't really comprehend so it's and, and yet no. I suppose you want to keep her young but some of her innocence has has obviously passed as a result of going through yeah. what is a, you know a, a very traumatic moment so yeah it, try, trying trying mm -hmm. to keep the balance with obviously her becoming more emotionally mature because of that with her youth because she's still so young I know, um, but it, it is good. And she is now very, I mean, she talked to me about the last time uh, that she talked with the psychologist that she uh, talked about how betrayed she felt by the school. Um, because at the time the school that she was at didn't really understand. So she, we, when she went back, the doctor said she was supposed to go back at half time, um, just on doing half days basically. And the school said, no, you can't do half days. You either repeat the whole year or you have to do what you can. Thank you.